Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Very pleased to have you. Um, maybe before we delve into the detail, could you give us just a little bit on your background and your role at uh, Afterpay? That would be great. Sure. So I started off as an engineer, probably spent about the first 10 years of my career as a consultant going on various different client sites, working on lots and lots of different projects across lots of technologies, then kind of got bored of the consulting game, so joined predominantly product companies after that. And the focus was actually on owning something and actually growing that. So these days I'm the CTO at Afterpay. Um, you know, my role is part sort of engineering, looking after the engineering teams, and part people engineering, funnily enough. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff to do with regards to team scale and how teams actually evolve, particularly moving from a startup phase to a scale-up phase. Great. Well, we'll get into that in a, mm -hmm. in a little while. A um, little bit of a secret here. I'm a wee bit of a shopper. <laughs> so I do see the Afterpay logo in a lot of the shops that I go to around Australia. But mm -hmm. for those of the folks <coughs> here who don't know what Afterpay is and what you do, could you just tell us a little bit about the company and the mission? That would be great. Sure. So our mission is becoming the w world's most loved way to pay. But effectively, we're taking a traditional credit model and so on and um, introduced a service whereby you can purchase something and split it up into four different payments and so on. So we're a digital first company. Um, we're native to the cloud. But we're offering this service as a means of improving people's ability to budget for things, people's ability yeah. to actually pay the, the way they want. And if you go and talk to customers, um, this is a service that they actually love and enjoy using and so on. So, and we offer it through a couple of different channels. So we have an in-store channel, which a lot of people don't actually realise, but if you go into the shopping centre, you'll see the Afterpay logo pretty much all over yep. the place. So you can buy for in-store and where we actually live predominantly, which is online, so most of our online stores have an Afterpay presence or a way to effectively split your payments into instalments. It's a really great story for an Australian mm -hmm. fintech company. Um, and over the last few years, you've seen some enormous growth and scaling. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the learnings that you've had through that process, you and the team? Sure. So I think it's worthwhile kind of noting that we started off in Australia, moved, uh, expanded over to New Zealand, we're now in the US and the UK. Yeah. And each market has given us slightly different insights into how this model actually evolves. And so adjusting to that has been interesting for the team. Um, also, I touched on it moving from a startup to a scale up phase. Actually, that, that there are a few pivotal moments that, um, where as engineers and so on, you know, you have the entire code base in your head and you understand everything about the whole system, and then suddenly your world starts breaking apart into services and microservices. Yeah. And you lose that connectivity, and working through that change with the team has been pretty pivotal. Through the, through the process, you know, we moved from a team of, uh, let's say, 100 a couple of years back to 500 plus these wow. days. And that's been a, um, a rapid and an int interesting change. Um, the other thing through that is also um, getting teams more and more connected to the customer. We have, um, we have a team that's highly engaged and uh, we have a product that customers absolutely love. We have some of the highest NPS ratings around, but actually getting the team to understand the detail of what the customer experience is about. Um, if, if I use an example, our predominant at the moment customer segment is um, female. Yeah. Um, from, a, from a shopping perspective and so on, <laughs> most of our engineers are actually male to some extent. So, you know, bri bridging, <laughs> that, um, bridging that diversity gap and actually understanding the mindset of the customer and actually living the detail of, that uh, of how customers how interact do you do with that? us. Does everyone have their own account so they can test it out? Uh, <laughs> everyone is encouraged to have their own <laughs> account. Now, what we've actually found with most of our engineers and so on, they've somehow figured out the bike shop that actually 
um, has <laughs> Afterpay and use Afterpay there. But no, a lot of it's about our connectedness to our customers is around rapid pace of change. Um, what we want to do is obviously everyone's talked about kind of you know journey mapping and understanding what the customers have to say but we want to augment that with rapid experimentation because one of the things we actually do understand is most of the things that we'll put out there will not work yeah so therefore how do we actually learn about something very very quickly in a fast moving world so that um, I guess the bets we're making are short-lived bets that have a higher chance of success. So that's how we focus on the engineers actually understand. The other one is encouraging people to understand the detail. Like yeah. The engineers need, need to live in the detail of the customer life cycle. And I like to use a little example that I use as a litmus test when I talk to engineering teams. Um, so usually I'll get lots of requests every day that come up and go, hey, um, there's this new technology, you want to use it? And then go, well, why would you like to use it? And um, usually it's oh, it'll you know, sp speed up my testing or um, it'll, imp it'll improve something or I want to learn about it, et cetera. And there's a sh subtle shift that happens when your engineers are actually engaged with your customers and truly understand. They'll start talking about why a certain new thing will actually solve a particular customer problem. Um, and it's very subtle, it, it doesn't have, but that's when you know that your engineers are actually engaged, they understand what the customer is actually going through, and they're not doing the typical thing which goes, hey, I'm the typical customer, um, and, you know, yeah, it works for me, why doesn't it work for everyone else? Yeah, I mean, being close <laughs> to the customer is so important and understanding what they need, and you're talking a lot about the, you know, your team and... Um, the changes that they've mm. had to make. Can you talk to us a little bit about how your team is structured and any, maybe any changes that you've had to make through uh, to the team structure through the last couple of years? Yes, yeah, so I think I touched a little bit upon it. We used to be one large team and uh, we're moving towards a large number of small teams effectively. Yeah. And that's kind of almost the simplest way of putting the, the, the change that we're going through. Um, logically, you know, we've broken it down into domains so that if we want, we want to have autonomous teams. For autonomous teams, they actually need to go and own certain aspects of their code base or certain customer sets so that they're truly connected to the customer. Um, and then, then breaking effectively, trying to break the problem down. Um, so the thing that we've actually had to work towards is, you know, you draw up uh, your, your structure, you draw up the domains, and you draw up your OKRs, everything seems to fit. But the thing that people forget is that your software doesn't quite look like that, and, and so on. So, um, the, the thing that we've had to work most, you know, and if you, if you, if you believe Conway's law is a the thing, then yeah. we've actually had to try and re-architect the software so that it fits, to some degree, the team structure that we actually want. Um, so that we can actually keep scaling our teams and so on. Yeah, interesting. We went through a similar <laughs> exercise at New Relic ourselves a couple of years back. Um, you know, in line with that, how does the, the leadership team then yourself and the leadership team at Afterpay, how do you keep everyone's eye on the goal and make sure everyone is aligned towards that North Star? Yeah, so we're pretty explicit about what our business strategy, product strategy, and technical strategy is, or let's call it strategy or call it vision. We reiterate it quite often. It's not fixed in stone, but it is, we realize that when we change, let's say pivot away from one of the strategies to another strategy, then that's actually a change management exercise um, for our entire team, and we need to provide them with the context, the, the case for the change, and ultimately reset all of the, let's call it the OKRs, the yeah. goals and metrics, and reset potentially some of the guardrails that exist within the organisation that um, help with the decision-making process. One of our aims is to make the decisions as close to the tin as possible or as close to the engineering as possible. So as a leadership group, it's really around setting the right context and the right, let's call it, settings and guardrails so that the engineers can actually make the decisions. 
Uh, uh, I think there's some famous sayings that kind of go, hey, we hire a lot, you know, highly experienced engineers and so on, and then what's the point of going and telling them exactly what to do? Uh, you know, they need to make the decisions and have the context of why they're making some of those decisions. Absolutely makes perfect sense, although you did touch on it earlier and mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to it. Engineers like shiny things, shiny new things. <laughs> um, how do you stop the explosion of shiny new things and tools and languages from proliferating and potentially, you know, taking you away from those goals? Yeah, so th there is another bit in, in the structure that's pretty important. So we, in, we invest pretty heavily in our platform teams or effectively internal pro engineering product teams. Mm. Um, and we have, call them standards, call them guidelines, call them uh, rules, that are simple uh, and that, uh, that, that are non-negotiable to some degree. And what we try and do is to go, here's a um, mechanism of actually achieving your, um, uh, let's say, achieving the standards. You know, we've invested time in building this thing for you. You could go and use that. Or you could go and do it yourself and spend four or five months learning about the whole thing. And, um, and that kind of tends to balance it out, where occasionally there is need for going and innovating and investing because you don't want to kill that off. But most of the time, people are connected to the customer problem. They understand the, uh, the ecosystem that they operate within and the rules that they operate within and make choices to use the things that we've kind of invested in. Um, because yeah, ultimately, like you said, in engineering teams are inherently inflationary uh, <laughs> with regards to technology and we don't want to kill that but we um, once again going back to I think um, I think Werner from AWS says this we don't want them doing under differentiated heavy lifting uh, so we want them to be building the uh, building on top of some of the things that we've invested yeah. in focusing on the innovation yeah. I guess um, while we're talking about the the tech stack Given mm -hmm. your rapid growth, um, you know, and the scaling, I guess, that's required mm -hmm. as you launch into new markets like the US, have you had to change uh, the tech stack at all or the way that you scale? So we haven't changed the tech stack at all. I, I mean, we're, we're ultimately not that old, so therefore... Mm. Um, there have been conversations around changing tech stacks. Um, we've certainly evolved the architecture and so on, but uh, changing tech stacks was, I guess, an interesting intellectual exercise, but not one that actually served any particular purpose. So ultimately, what we've invested in is um, coming up with alternate architectures that actually allow us to meet with that scale, still utilising effectively the same tech stacks. Yeah. Um, so we've invested, I think people have talked about, we've kind of invested very heavily in things like streaming, in um, asynchronous architectures so that we can ultimately achieve that team scale. And how does New Relic help you see what's going on in your environment? So one of the focus areas that we've had is ultimately, ultimately everything's about shortening cycles. We're, things move so fast these days. Mm. Uh, we have to be able to kind of um, shorten our cycles. You know, we're, if we're, let's say, at a weekly deploys and releases, we want to get to daily. If we're at daily, we want to get to um, effectively every commit going in. Now, it's, it's being ultimately around that. We've ha had to heavily move towards more canarying and actually testing in production, synthetics, and actually understanding what else is going on in our production systems. And that's where things like New Relic or funnily, observability as a whole yeah. concept actually come in, comes in really useful is you need to understand exactly what's happening pretty much the instance something goes out there, uh, whether it be to 1% of your customer base or 100% of your customer base. You need to be able to understand the trends. You need to be able to understand um, deviations from trends and react to them pretty quickly. Uh, and that's where New Relic is pretty heavily used for us at the moment. Fantastic, and you know, this is uh, a crazy ride for you guys, but what are you focused on next from a, a technology perspective? Look, for us it's all about, ultimately we don't want to 
overinvest in technology for technology that, that for scale that we think we'll achieve in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. So it's finding the balance between, hey, we need to do things right now, we need to do things in about three to six months, and finding that kind of architectural pathway through that so that we're not just at the edge, but just a little bit ahead of where we think some of the projected numbers are going to be. And there are examples where, as we enter new markets and so on, we, we understand new things. For example, when we entered the US market, there is this concept of flash sales in the US market where effectively you can have, it, it's a little bit like Netflix launching a new movie and so yeah. on. You get this peak demand for about 10 minutes where everyone jumps on and shops. And that's something that you know, we didn't see in Australia, that it's kind of something that we needed to react to, and now that we know that, we kind of need to model those things out. You're ready for it. Yeah. Also, Hale, thank you so much for your time and your insight today. Mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, for anyone that would like to catch up with Sohail, he'll be outside, and I'm sure you'd love to answer some questions. I'd love to. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank